In this video, we're gonna talk about everything that you need to do on your BMAT test day, and then we're gonna talk about what's gonna happen after you've sat it and everything about results. We'll start with that, and then at the end, we'll talk about some of the common FAQs that I get from people, any questions, and then we'll answer exactly what you need to know to make sure that you smash your BMAT and get the score needed to get into the medical school of your dreams. So the first thing for you to know is that the local test center that you book that BMAT with will give you the specific details in terms of location, times to turn up, and all that other stuff. But for some general tips and advice, here is what I'm going to tell you. Don't make the mistake of arriving really stressed out to your BMAT by not planning the journey. So of course, just make sure that you map your route and just are familiar with exactly how you're going to get there, because that's just one thing that's going to take the stress out of the day. Now let's talk about what you should actually bring to the test. You must bring valid photographic identification to the test, whether that's a passport, driving license, or provisional, or even student ID. Make sure that you bring the equipment needed, so a soft pencil and eraser for sections one and two, and a black ink pen for section three. And just remember that you're not allowed to use any correction fluid. Dictionaries, both English and bilingual, as well as calculators are not allowed for any of the sections. Of course, you're not allowed to take any food and drink in, but you can take in a bottle of water as long as it is clear and the label's removed. And sometimes your test center might give you an additional instruction of some things to bring that aren't listed here. So actually for the test, the center will give you a place to safely store all of your belongings. Do the usual sensible stuff of turning off your phone and electronic devices because you won't be able to take them to the desk and you don't want them beeping in your bag during the exam. And then you'll be given a statement of entry which will contain your candidate number. This is the number that you're going to have to write on the test paper. Remember that you're going to get three answer booklets for sections one, two, and three. Each section of the test is completed one after the other. You will be told when you can start each section based on the time given. So section one, 60 minutes, section two, 30 minutes, and section three, another 30 minutes. And you can't borrow the time from one section to use for another. So it's a set period for each of those sections. Of course, you'll have an invigilator who'll talk you through all of the rules, but if you have any questions, of course, you can raise your hand and ask them. And don't do anything silly like talk to other test takers during the test, which you know obviously you can't do. And if you've made any access arrangements or modified paper requests, as long as you've submitted those within the deadline, they will be there ready at your desk when you arrive. So at the end of the test, what will happen is that you will get a confidential results information sheet. Now, this sheet will contain your login details to access your BMAT scores via the merit test system on results day. Now this test might feel a little bit weird because this is what university tests are normally like and it might be the first time you've sat it in this sort of format. But some of the usual test things remain the same. So stay in your seat and don't leave until you're told you're able to do so and make sure that you don't take any of the test papers or even rough paper that you've used for workings with you when you leave. And of course if you have any problems or have had any problems during the exam that the invigilators need to know about, just make sure that you tell them before you leave at the end. So after the test you'll want to chill out and forget all about it all until about five weeks later when you'll get your results. If you had any problems with the test, whether it was technical issues with the computer if you're using one, or whether there's just some, any problems at all, you can apply for special consideration. So circumstances under which you can apply for special consideration are if you suffered temporary illness, injury, or indisposition at the time of the test, or there were problems with the administration of the test, such as a fire alarm during the exam, or access arrangements that you requested upon registering, but they weren't made available to you. So if you want to submit some of those special consideration forms, I've linked below to where you can do that, but it's really, really important that you do it within five working days of sitting the test so that they can actually use it and inform the universities about what happened. One of the questions that I get asked about this is for the exam, are non-native English speakers allowed any extra time? And the answer is no, you get two hours for the test as long as you don't have any access requirements. So then let's talk about what happens with them sharing those BMAT results with your selected universities. So in the UK, your results are automatically sent to any BMAT universities that you informed your test center about when registering for the test. If between the time of registering your exam and then submitting your UCAS application, if any of the universities that you've chosen to apply to have changed, then it's important that you inform the test center to let them know to send those results to those new universities that you're actually applying for. And if you do that, it's important that you submit any changes to your exam officer before the test date itself. Another important question is that of how the universities actually use my BMAT score. And actually in this video here, I've broken it down university by university for the eight or so medical schools that use the BMAT in the UK. But the main thing is that universities can Consider your BMAT score alongside the other information in your application so they can decide whether or not to invite you to interview. And then also once they've interviewed you, they may use that score alongside other elements of the med school application, then they'll make an overall decision as to whether to offer you a place. If you want to find out more about the other elements of the medical school application,
education that are important and how to excel in those as well. Check out this video here where I direct you to all the resources for all the important aspects of the med school application and how to excel in each of those. So then let's talk about special consideration. So if anything went wrong around or during the exam, if you've submitted a request for special consideration, they will investigate the information you provided and inform your chosen university of the outcome so that they can consider it alongside all the other information and what to do as to whether to invite you to interview and offer you a place. It's important to know that the score that you get does not reflect any of the special consideration. So it will be purely about your performance on the day. So the score you get is the score you get. Then what the universities do with that score based on special considerations is up to them. And the universities will use all of the information they've got from the special consideration alongside the score to make sure that you've been treated fairly. So I'm going to use the most recent year's explanation of results to go through it and help you understand how the BMAT's marked and kind of how the results should be interpreted. So results for sections one and two are reported on the BMAT scale, which runs from one to nine. And scores are reported to one decimal place. Extreme scores are expected to be comparatively rare. So the scale has actually been designed so that the typical applicant to the most highly selective undergraduate university course will score in the region of about a 5.0. But just to point out that a typical applicant who's applying to these sorts of courses by that very nature is a very able student. So this is really a way for the really high ranking universities like Oxford and Cambridge to ascertain the real kind of cream of the crop. So getting an average score in these exams is actually doing quite well. The best applicants will score more highly, but six represents a comparatively high score, and only very few exceptional applicants will achieve BMAT scores higher than 7.0. And on the screen now, I'm gonna show you a graph of the typical distribution of scores in a previous year of what you can see for sections one and two. And then for section three, as you might recall in this video, I talked through the marking criteria and how to make sure that you kind of end up in that 5A status, the top score that you can get for section three. So have a look at that video to check out what you need to be achieving to get into that sort of status. So remember that each essay is double marked and if both markers agree on a score, then obviously that's what you'll get. And then if there's any disparity, they usually just split the difference and give the average of the two. And if there's a large disparity between the two scores in the writing section, then a third person marks it and it's actually sent to a BMAT manager or a BMAT assessment manager and they will kind of finally check the final score before it's released. So on the screen now for section three, I've put the distributions of scores from a previous previous year for both the quality of English and the quality of responses. And as you can see, actually, nearly about 17, nearly 80% score an A for the quality of English. So most people are getting the highest mark for that. And then the typical score for the quality of answers and content is around the three to 3.5. And remember that how the BMAT score is actually used varies from institution to institution. But if you check out this video here, I go through each of the eight BMAT UK universities and show exactly how they use the BMAT score as part of their selection process. And we'll wrap up with some common FAQs. The first one is, can I sit the BMAT twice in the same cycle? And the answer is no, and you definitely should not do that because it might be construed as cheating and they might just throw out your UCAS application altogether. Another question is, if I got a good score last year, can I reuse that score for this year's application? And the answer is no, you cannot. You have to sit the BMAT within the year of the application cycle that you are taking. So as an example, if you are applying in September of let's say 2024, there is usually a BMAT sitting a few months prior to that in February, some sometimes as well in March, depending on the year, post COVID it has changed slightly. Then there'll also be one in September some years. And then the big one, the main one will be the kind of November, October sorts of sitting. So potentially usually two these days, but sometimes four sittings in a year, but those are the only ones available to you when you're applying for that year. So if you did one in the November of the year prior, that does not count towards this application cycle when you're sitting or applying for BMAT universities. But the flip side of that is, if you got a terrible BMAT score in the year before and then are reapplying, they will consider your application afresh and will not consider the previous one that you bombed in the last application cycle. Another common question is what is a good BMAT score? And again, if you click the information button here, it will show you that video where I talk through all of the scores that you need to make sure you get into each of the respective universities. So last two FAQs, one is, can the BMAT results be queried or appealed? So if you believe that there has been an error in the processing or reporting of your results, you can ask your center to submit a results inquiry on your behalf. This must be submitted within five working days from the release of your results. And if a candidate thinks a malpractice or a results inquiry outcome was incorrectly handled, they can submit an appeal. 
For more information about all that kind of stuff, if you look in the description below, I've posted links to where you can find out all about that. And the final question I get is, what if I've misplaced my confidential results information sheet? What can I do about that? And if you can't find it, either you or your exam center can call the customer support team and you'll have to provide some ID and they will reissue one to you. So that about wraps all of the series up with everything to do with the BMAT. If you want to go through the entire series to find out all the information about the BMAT and just the practicalities of it, check out this playlist here. Otherwise, if you want to find out how you can maximize your score and get a 14 plus that's required to get into Oxbridge universities, I recommend you check out this playlist here where we're gonna give you all the best techniques and tactics to score highly. Thanks for watching and I'll see you over in those playlists.